chapter 10. It might be helpful for us, though, to sort of remind ourselves of what we talked about last week. And we, or what we talked about two weeks ago, rather, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, the latter half of that. Uh, we know that in chapter 9, we're introduced to Saul for the very first time. He is uh, in a predicament. His father's donkeys have been lost. Saul and one of, his, one of the servants have been entrusted by his father, Kish, to go and find the donkeys. And we talked about how this is probably a journey that in, in all, maybe was somewhere around 25 to 30 miles in total distance. So they're out. They have no success. Saul's essentially ready to pack it in and to go back and just say, we lost them. We can't, we can't find them. Well, the servant, of course, had said that there is a city nearby called Ramah, and there's a special person living in that city. And who was that person? Samuel, Samuel right? Samuel the prophet. And even though Saul and the servant, uh, there's a little bit of a question about what would they bring to the, to the prophet of God. Well, it turns out they had half a shekel, a fourth part of a shekel of silver. They take it to him. And so they both go to meet with Samuel. They don't know where he's at. They have to talk with uh, a group of women outside the city. And they go and they finally find Samuel. And Samuel, as it says in verse 15 of chapter 9, you know, all of this has been happening probably, um, really the providence of God has been at work, at least in the first 14 verses with Saul, because God is telling Samuel that he is about to meet who will become the first king of Israel. And so Samuel goes and meets with Saul. Um, of course, Saul, you know, he was there to try to figure out what happened with his donkeys, or his father's donkeys. But at this point, Samuel tells Saul that something greater for you is about to happen. You're being called to, uh, to, uh, uh, to serve God in a, a much greater capacity than he ever had before. And we know that Saul and the servant, they go and they eat with Samuel um, and with others at a feast. And we recall that at the end of chapter 9 that Saul essentially receives the best part of the meal. And this was to show to the people that were there, uh, in, a, in a way to show the same thing to Saul that, um, you know, he is going to be king. You know, this is sort of a, a practical way of showing that by giving him the choice things because the king, of course, got the choice goods. Oftentimes, they leave at the end of verse at the end of chapter 9, Saul and Samuel sort of talk privately, and the servant is told to go away. Saul tells, or Samuel tells Saul to, to, to tell the servant to go forward so that they can talk. And that's where we pick up in chapter 10, where we see that Saul is going to be anointed as the king of Israel. So let's look at verses, let's start off by looking at verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1 says that Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? So again, this is all being done essentially in private. The servant has been told to move forward. Might have been that, you know, for Saul's sake, it might have been better to, to do this in private. You know, Saul had recognized earlier that Samuel was telling him that he would become the king of Israel. Um, those are words that, you know, Saul was never expecting. Uh, this is something that's, that, that's very unique. Maybe we don't know why, but for some reason the, the, the servant has gone ahead. Samuel sort of does this in private. He's, he's going to make a more public uh, showing of this later on. But if you look in Exodus chapter 29, verse 7, this is uh, somewhat similar to when Aaron was anointed to be the high priest and his family. And as we talked about with anointing, uh, again, it just indicates that someone has really arrived at a new status. And in particular, when it came to the children of Israel with kings or with a high priest, it showed you were uh, being specially designated by God for his service. And that's what Saul is doing. As we talked about in chapter 9, he, and as what it said in 10 verse 1, that Saul is going to be the captain of over, his, over God's inheritance, or over the people of God. Uh, when you think about this oil, um, I, I did a little bit of research into it um, about what this oil was. Um, and it's said that it was composed of liquid myrrh, fragrant cinnamon, fragrant cane, cassia, and olive oil. 
So the idea is that, you know, you think about oil uh, that comes out of a car, kind of nasty. Um, maybe you don't care for the smell. The type of oil that would be anointed on kings was probably something that actually smelled pretty good. Um, and so it's valuable. And again, Saul is being set apart uh, for the service of God for a specific task. Again, you know, this is all being done in private. Maybe Saul's reaction, uh, may, maybe Saul would struggle uh, believing this. We, we know we're about to see that th there are going to be some signs that accompany with this. Um, but again, this anointing at this point is private. Now, you think about the inheritance of God. You know, the, the main point that Samuel is trying to get across to Saul is not that he's just going to be the king over Israel to do what he wants, but at the end of the day, you're just simply a steward of what God has given you, right? If he is the captain over God's inheritance, you think about what an inheritance is, right? It's something that inherently belongs to God, his people. You know, when God changed Jacob's name to Israel, to and the name Israel meaning the prince of El or the prince of God, that was... Uh, Again, God reaffirming that these are his people. These are not Saul's people. These are his people. And as, essentially, as long as Saul functioned in that light, that he was simply a steward of God's people rather than the uh, end-all, be-all head ruler, things generally went well for Saul, but that wouldn't always be the case. You know, the same thing applies to us today, I think, when we think about you know, our relationship with one another. Um, maybe in the relationship, too, between, you know, the elders and the other members of the congregation. Um, you know, the elders, um, in a sense, are stewards of God's people. They have been entrusted. First uh, Peter chapter 5 refers to them as the shepherd, right? And generally, the, the shepherd of a flock is there to tend to the flock, but generally the shepherd was not the owner of the flock. And you can think about David, right? David was a shepherd of his father's sheep. He was a steward of that I want to look at John chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. I think John sort of uh, reiterates uh, something really that's similar along the same lines of Christians, again, being the inheritance of God, the, uh, the, the children, the offspring of God. You know, Jesus earlier in the chapter said that he was the good shepherd uh, there in, in chapter 10. But you note in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 26, or beginning of verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And a lot of people take this passage to say that, you know, you can't ever fall away from salvation uh, in light of this. But really what Jesus is getting across the point is that, you know, the people that bear his name, the people that obey the gospel, they are his. At the end of the day, as the structure of the church is laid out, you know, Christ is the king. You know, there's not, uh, even though we have a system in place in, in terms of structure and how the, elderships or the elders are the shepherds uh, of the congregation, um, you know, the elders don't own the congregation in that sense. Christ is the ultimate head of the church. Um, and so you get the idea again here that Saul is simply sort of the steward of what God um, has allowed him uh, to be over, his inheritance. And you see various, uh, again, various ideas about that in the New Testament. So Saul, you're the captain over his inheritance, but not only is this going to be assigned to you, this private anointing, but there's also going to be some other things that are going to sort of seal the deal, we might could say, in that common verses 2 through 6. All right, so beginning in verse 2, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The donkeys which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the donkeys and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor. And there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel. 
one carrying three kids and another carrying three loaves of bread and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. And after that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery, a tabret, a pipe, and a harp before them. And they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and thou and shalt be turned into another man. Right, so you've got Samuel here beginning in verse 2 saying that as you're on your way home, what's going to help confirm uh, this message is that three different groups of people are going to come to you and they're going to do three specific things. And, you, and what I say they will do and what eventually you will do in verse 6 will come to pass. And so that's further confirmation that Saul would be the king of Israel. Right, you put yourself and you think about it, you just... You know, put yourself in Saul's shoes. You've just been told you're going to be the king of Israel. And even though Samuel has come and anointed your head, probably still be a little bit of doubt, right? You don't really know Samuel that well. You, you may know of his reputation, um, but again, there may still be some lingering doubt. And you can put yourself in any, any position like this uh, with, you know, any type of job that you have. You know, if you're a teacher, maybe you teach elementary school, high school, something like that. And one day, the, uh, whoever's over the head of education for the county, uh, maybe the superintendent, comes in and says that you're going to be the head principal at the high school. Um, right? That's going to be a shock to you. You know, somebody from the Department of, of Education comes in and says that, you know, I know you're a teacher, but uh, tomorrow you're going to be selected to be the superintendent of the school system in the county where you're at, or the, the district where you're at, right? People, if you're in that position, you're going to be surprised. You're really not going to believe that, especially if you don't know that person personally that has told you that that would happen. You know, if you work for a company and somebody comes in um, that, that works a little bit higher up, uh, comes in and says that tomorrow you're going to be made into a manager, or you're going to be promoted to CEO, uh, and all of this is going to happen within the next couple of days, if you don't know that person very well or their credentials, you're probably not going to believe them, right? Because it's just, it sounds way too good to be true. Well, if you put yourself in Saul's shoes, Saul's going to be essentially promoted from being, you know, one of the members of Kish's household who, um, even though powerful, maybe not the most powerful in Benjamin, is going to be promoted all the way to being the king of Israel. It would be hard to believe. If you put yourself in your shoes, it might be hard to believe in that. But all these signs that are about to happen to Saul are going to put confidence in him. And it will show that what God says, what Samuel says, is true. And this is a good point for us when it comes to, you know, God does confirm his word to us, right? We, we don't have any reason to doubt what God's word says because he always confirms it. You know, maybe he reiterate it, reiterates it multiple times. Obviously, you know, we don't live in this time where the miraculous is going on and, and things like that. Uh, but we have the examples of where God's word was confirmed to, to different people. And the point being that for us is that we can have trust in what God's word says because he always uh, confirms the uh, messages given. We, you know, we talked about faith, right? Saul... Um, you know, had to have a lot of faith here. We talked about how we don't see our sins washed away. We, uh, there, there's some things about heaven that we don't understand, but we have faith because we know that God confirms his word. If that's what he said about it, if that's what he said about those who obeyed the gospel, we can trust that because God always sticks to his word. That's what Samuel's getting across here to Saul. God's going to give you plenty of evidence for you to believe that you will become the king. So three different people here. We see the first group beginning in verse 2. Saul leaves. They're going to encounter a group of men that tell him about the whereabouts of the donkeys, essentially, that they are found. Now, verse 2 talks about that they, are at Ra that they come to Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin. Um, you know, Genesis chapter 35, verse 19, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, uh, all reference Rachel's tomb. Um, and certainly Rachel uh, 
uh, was very important to Jacob. It might have been that for some of the Israelites, you know, they knew where Rachel's sepulcher was because Rachel was the wife of Jacob, you know, who was called the Prince of El. So the thing about it here, though, is that even though the donkeys are found, the father has essentially said, you know, if the donkeys are gone, then they're just simply gone. But what I'm really concerned about now is where my son is at. Right? Lo, the father hath left the care of the donkeys, and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? And we talked about this before, that back in chapter 9, Saul made the point that, to the servant that, you know, even though we can't find the donkeys, that at some point the father is going to be worried about where I'm at. And what you see in chapter 10 is that Saul's assumptions about his father were correct. The father is the type of father that did not prioritize his possessions, did not prioritize um, earthly, uh, insignificant matters over the safety and concern of his son. A really good example of, uh, of a father we might could point out. If you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 33, there are some that, that suggest that it might have been that Saul was an only child at this point. I, I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, but if so, then obviously, you know, there is a certain level of, you know, you worry about your son because you worry about what your possessions are going to do, right? Because it passes down to the son. Either way, the father is concerned about the son. And we'll see later on, verses 9 down through verse uh, 11 that all these things are going to come to pass. So that's the first group. The second group comes in verse 3. Uh, there are uh, men, three men, uh, with uh, three animals and three loaves of bread. Uh, that they, it says in verse 3 that they are going up to Bethel, which of course the, the name Bethel just means the house of God. This is where Jacob had built an altar. It might have been that some people went and worshipped at this place. Um, when, you, when you think about the animals that are mentioned, the three kids, uh, this is possibly what's, what's going on here. And you can sort of read about some offerings that are connected with this in, in Leviticus chapter 2 and Numbers chapter 15. But you know that they will, verse 4, it says that they will salute thee. Now, it's not salute in the sense that, you know, they're going out there and giving them a military salute or uh, maybe a salute that a police officer does. The, the idea of here is a salute is a greeting, um, but a warm greeting. You know, it's not the, uh, you know, you, maybe you're walking past someone in the hall or um, you're walking past someone on the street and you might know them kind of and you say, hey, and, and they say, hey, back, and you just sort of pass each other by. Um, that's not the type of greeting that's sort of, that, that, that's being described here. Uh, this is sort of a very heartfelt greeting. Um, more of the idea like, hey, how are you doing? How's your family doing? Um, how's life treating you? Things like that where you, you sort of strike up a conversation. That's the idea of, a, of the type of greeting in verse 4. So it's a very heartfelt type of greeting. And maybe the picture here is that the three men are providing food to Saul. Uh, verse 4 talks about the bread, some of the bread being given to Saul. We keep in mind in 1 Samuel chapter 9 that before they got to Ramah, Saul and his servant did not have any food um, because they would have offered that to Samuel. So maybe the, uh, the two individuals here, they, they give of their means uh, to help Saul and maybe his servant who, who are perhaps a little bit hungry. And, and in all, what you see in verse 4 again is the, the idea of hospitality. Um, and in the uh, Middle East, we, we were talking about this, I believe, in uh, church history, class, but the idea of hospitality was very important. You know, we, we emphasize, you know, southern hospitality uh, and being friendly, uh, you know, to people that we meet. Um, they might have, well, we might could say they took that to another level. Um, there was a, it, was, it was sort of ingrained within that culture to be hospitable to strangers. In fact, the Law of Moses talked about that on, on several occasions. So these are hospitable people, but again, this is again to show that Saul would be king because this will come to pass, as we'll see in verses 9 and 10. Verse 5, the third group that you will encounter are the prophets. Thou shalt come to the hill of God where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when thou art come near to the city that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery, a tabret, a pipe, a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. So the Philistine garrisons... Uh, 
King James there renders it garrison singular. Um, there are other translations that have that plural. Could have been, it could be that what's being done here is a little bit of foreshadowing because in 1 Samuel chapter 13, um, Saul and his army are going to attack this garrison of the Philistines and overtake it. Maybe that's what's being described here. The real importance are the men that Saul will meet. They are a company of prophets. It's thought that there might have been a school here where prophets were being trained at the time. And this, uh, of course, would be a place of learning and things like that. Saul's not trained as a prophet. Um, and so that what, that's what makes verse 6 very interesting, right? You have a list of musical instruments that are used here. Again, this is not necessarily connected with worship per se, but you do have a list of instruments given. Um, the psaltery, it's I've got a little bit of a description here. The psaltery is kind of a lyre um, that one would play. Um, the tabret was sort of like a drum or a, or a tambourine type instrument. The pipe, of course, was sort of like a flute, um, something that you breathed in, and you know because you breathe in it, the air coming out would create a sound. And then we know what the harp is, uh, the type of string instrument that David would play uh, to sort of um, calm Saul later on. So when it comes to the prophets, verse 6, what's going to be interesting for you, Saul, is not only are you going to meet them, but you're going to start doing the same thing that they are credited as doing. You're going to be able to prophesy, not because of who you are, but because of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon you. Now, you see another instance of this, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon someone, and it goes back to the book of Judges. And... I'll see if you can remember, because we talked about him not too long ago. Um, but what important character in the book of Judges was it said that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him? Samson, right? But in the case of Samson, when it said that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, it was in the sense of Samson receiving physical strength, which is, uh, again, for you know the delivery of the Israelites. Here, though, the Spirit of the Lord... Is not giving Saul spiritual strength, but the ability to prophesy. And that the Spirit of the Lord being with him, again, shows God's approval. The prophets will recognize that. And it says there at the end of verse 6 that Saul shall be turned into another man. And you might think about this, uh, you know, in the sense of like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing, right? Where a person completely changes into something that's, you know, that's very different. Uh, maybe that, that may be how some people first read that. All, the, all that means is that the, the type of mindset that Saul has will change. Um, sort of the idea that whatever lingering doubts were in Saul's mind, by verse 6, um, when all these things come to pass, verses 9 and 10, Saul's not going to have any lingering doubts. He's going to have uh, at least confidence in this moment. Now, later on we'll see that, you know, Saul, Saul uh, still struggles a little bit um, in chapter 11. But again, the idea that God confirms his word. That's the message that Saul, was, that, that Saul was to learn, that Samuel was instructing him. That's something that when we look at this, we can remind ourselves in the New Testament that a lot of the examples that God has given us, uh, again, come from the inspiration of the words of God. But if God took care of his people then, we should have confidence that he takes care of us now and for eternity if we are faithful to him. God always confirms his word. Well, that being said, are there any comments that you'd like to add on through verse 6? We struggle, we struggle with, in other words, we, we say we believe what God says, but sometimes we, we, we struggle with faith. Has God really forgiven me? Well, if I've obeyed his word, there ought not be any doubt in my mind. God says, if you do this, I'll do this. And yet sometimes there's a big question mark in our mind, whether it's that or something else. And again, that's where we have to work on our faith. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sometimes we, sometimes the hardest person uh, to seek forgiveness uh, to seek forgiveness from is often yourself. Um, I know, I know sometimes that can be hard for me. It's something maybe that I struggle with sometimes. Uh, Learning how to forgive yourself can be very, very tough. Um, I was thinking that you brought that up. 
one of the things that we were talking about was uh, in, in church history was um, there are a lot of people that departed from the faith that after the persecution was over they wanted to uh, come back and to repent and there were some Christians that said that you know because you left the faith because you renounced Christ you denied him um, you got to do a lot more to earn your repentance or earn your forgiveness back and that's in contrast uh, one of the points that you see is that's in contrast to what you see in Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus confirmed that um, you know once you repent of your sins you don't have to earn you don't have to go through a process of gradually earning that forgiveness back you are forgiven when you repent that was confirmed by the words of Jesus and so again the importance of the confirmation of the words of God so verses 7 through 8 some more instructions come to Saul it says, And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice, sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry, till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. So if you see verse 7, uh, depending on the translation you have, you... You, you see this phrase, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Um, almost similar to the idea of, you know, I believe the, the writer of Ecclesiastes puts it this way, whatsoever thy hand findest to do, do it with all thy might. And the point being here with Saul in verse 7 is that, you know, God's going to be with him. Um, and this is going to allow Saul to do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, good things. Now, this, of course, could be in reference to delivering the Israelites from the Philistines, which Saul could not do that on his own, but he had to serve God and rely on God's power for that to happen. But you also see sort of a similar idea of this happen in the life of David. Let's look in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. In 2 Samuel 7, David, it, it, it sort of... Uh, the idea that's presented is David sort of sitting around his house and he has a desire to build a house for God. And if you look at verses 1 through 3, it says that it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains, or the tabernacle. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And the point being was that Saul was not giving, uh, David here is not being given authority to do whatever he wants. When Samuel said that to Saul back in chapter 10, verse 7, Saul is not given the authority to do everything that he wants because you have to keep in mind, is this what God desires? That's the, the importance of the phrase, for the Lord is with thee. Because in 2 Samuel 7, David's desire is to build a house for God, but does God allow him to build the house? No, right? David's a man of war, and it's actually going to be Solomon that is given the opportunity to build God's house. So if David had tried to build the house, would God have approved of that? No, right? This Again, verse 3 in chapter 7, 2 Samuel 7, David did not have the freedom to do all that he wanted and expect that to be pleasing with God. It's just that the things that he would do if God approved of them, they would get done. Same thing with Saul in, in verse 7, right? Saul, if what you want to do lines up with what God's will, it will be done because he will be with you. Now verse 8, more instructions are, are following here that Saul will go down to Gilgal before Samuel. And Samuel will come down and offer burnt offerings and sacrifices, sacrifices of peace offerings, uh, and he'll tarry for seven days till he come and show thee what thou shalt do. Now, we don't know exactly, you know, how much time elapses here. You know, does the um, seven days refer to seven days after these signs have happened, or does, you know, after these signs have happened, that Saul immediately goes there and waits seven days for Samuel to show up? Not exactly sure about that. But the point being is that if Saul had done something different from what Samuel had said, and thus, 
be something that God had not approved, God would not have, uh, you know, God would not have been pleased with what Saul had done, right? Because verse 7, whatever Saul did, the, the important point is that it had to line up with what God's will. And even though Saul might have wanted to hurry the process up, um, he had to wait. He had to follow the instructions of God, um, which is important for us because, you know, what Saul's being faced with here is, uh, you know, testing his patience. He's got to wait uh, for these instructions uh, and for Samuel to uh, get through doing what he needs to get through doing. Um, and we know for us as Christians that sometimes waiting is a necessary part of life. Whether that's dealing with persecution, as James chapter 1 indicates, the trying of our faith worketh patience. Um, any type of persecution and things like that, you know, whether that's waiting for, um, you know, just the, uh, not just persecution, but just for certain moments in life. Um, you know, Jesus talked about don't be anxious, you know, don't um, constantly be worried about the future, right? Uh, impatient being the idea. Um, sometimes we do have to be patient, and as James again indicates that um, when our, our faith is tried, we respond correctly, um, it does work patience. Saul's got to be patient here, and um, that's what Samuel and God expect of him. All right, so we're going to try to get down through verse 16. Verses 9 through 16, verses 9 and 10 just simply uh, are, are simply a summation of you know, verses 2 and 6. Verses 9 and 10 essentially say that everything that was said in verses 2 through 6, it came to pass. As we talked about with Samuel before, none of the words that he spoke ever fell to the ground. None of the things that he predicted ever did not come to pass because God was with him. So all those things happened. Verse 11, it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also son, uh, among the prophets? So apparently where Saul is returned to here is, is probably his hometown because these are people that obviously know him and they know who his father is. Now what New Testament character does this remind us of? Verse 11. He lived, he, his, uh, not his birthplace, but where he grew up was in Nazareth. Jesus, right? You remember when Jesus went back to uh, Nazareth and he began teaching there. The Jews in that area said, is this not, Joseph, is this not Jesus, uh, the son of Joseph, the carpenter's son? Right? So they were surprised that he had this ability. Or they, they were surprised that he was up there teaching because he was only the son of a carpenter. He wasn't trained as a teacher of the law. Well, likewise, Saul was not uh, possibly trained as a prophet, yet you, know, you got people wondering here, is this, um, is this not the son of Kish, Saul, that we've known all this time that is now prophesying, something he has never done before? Um, so they, they asked the question, is Saul also among the prophets? Verse 12, one of the same place answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? Uh, now, it might be important to note the question here, but who is their father? Um, you know, when you think about the priesthood, the priesthood did pass on from father to son, right? Because it passed through the tribe of Levi. Uh, the high priest passed through the house of Aaron. So knowing the priest's father was about, you know, connecting that bloodline together, at least in your mind. Uh, but with the prophets, you know, prophets, you know, that, that office was not passed down, um, you know, from father to son, per se, right? God chose specific men to be prophets, right? Samuel's father, uh, Elkanah, he was not a prophet, but Samuel was. And so when they ask this question, but who is their father, it's sort of the question of who is their teacher, who is their leader, uh, is what's being asked here. And so it becomes a popular saying, at least in that town, is Saul also among the prophets. Again, probably because this is absolutely incredible, this transformation that Saul has undergone. Um, because you didn't have, you know, pro you didn't see prophets all. Uh, prophets were not necessarily a common thing in Israel. Um, so there's some time that elapses. Verse 13, it, it says that when he had made an end of prophesying, he came unto the high place. 
Uh, and then we have an encounter between Saul and his uncle. Verse 14 through 16 says that Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither ye went ye, or where did you go? And he said to seek the donkeys. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys were found. But the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. So he returns and Saul's uncle comes out to him. And you'd think that since Saul and his servant had been gone so long, uh, again, families are, are generally a lot more closely knit, per se, than what we think about today. You would think that Saul's uncle would know where he had been. Um, but that may not necessarily have been the case because, you know, he asked the question, whither went ye or where did you go? Um, and... Uh, you know, Saul just simply reiterates what happens to uh, Saul's uncle. Some have suggested, you know, based on the laws of, you know, uh, inheritance and the way that things worked, um, it could have been that Saul's uncle was younger than Saul's father. And the questioning about where Saul went would be that if something bad had happened to Saul, if Saul's uncle was the younger brother of Saul's father, Kish, that means that the inheritance and a lot of his possessions would then go to his uncle, especially if Saul was an only child. And some, some have suggested maybe that's why he, he's the line of questioning that he undergoes is, is why that he does. We don't know that for sure, but that's what some have suggested. But it's important to note as we come to a close, verse 16, that Saul said everything to his uncle, but he doesn't talk about the matter of the kingdom, or that Samuel has told him that he will become king. Uh, and if you're in Saul's position, Saul at this point probably understands what has happened, but it might be kind of hard to convince other people that he's going to become king. It might be hard uh, to convince others, or, or at least his uncle, about, um, you know, about all the things that had happened. Um, you know, maybe there's a principle in there. Sometimes it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, people that know you uh, the most, people that, that, that have known you a long time and have known you well, um, you know, may be harder for them to accept a dramatic change like that. Uh, maybe it's an idea here. Whatever the case may be, Saul is not openly talking about what has just happened where Samuel has anointed him king. Because as we're going to see next week, verse 17, this is going to essentially become a public uh, affair. It, it, people are going to know about this. This is a public event. And to Saul's credit, Saul's not going around bragging about how he's about to become king. Maybe he shows some humility in that. But it's going to be up to Samuel that demonstrates this to the people of Israel. And so next week we'll talk about uh, Saul, at least publicly, uh, being known as king. Um, and that's where we'll close tonight. Are there any thoughts or comments on what we've talked about this uh, thus far? A lot of folks were taking a front page ad in the paper. Yeah. I'm king, I'm king. Don't say that this, this trait, at least here for Saul. Yeah. Yeah, Brother Wayne was saying some people would probably take in a uh, you know, front page out of the newspaper to declare them, to, to state that they were declared king, but Saul doesn't do that. Maybe that shows Saul's humility. Uh, whatever the case may be, we will stop here tonight. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. We'll pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 17 uh, next week.